So we need to talk now about the three ways that we think about this hypostatic union. And we've got three rather fancy terms for this. And we call these the three genera. Genera is plural for genus. And genus simply means principle or category. And we have three of these. The first one we talk about is the genus idiomaticum. Genus idiomaticum. I just tell you guys are just eating this up. You love it. Lay on the Latin. Give me more. All right. The genus idiomaticum. Genus idiomaticum means the principle or the category of properties. So that's what idiomaticum means, properties. The genus idiomaticum is teaching that when the two natures fully human and fully God, the two natures come together, each nature's properties are present and active to enable Christ to carry out his work. So the natures, the properties of each nature are fully active. According to what needs to be done. fully active in the one person. So we've got two natures, one person, and the properties or the idiomata of each nature are fully active and present in the one person of Jesus. Example would be Jesus feeding the 5,000. To feed the 5,000, is the divine nature necessary? Yeah, okay. I'm not able to multiply loaves and fishes and feed 5,000 out of a sack lunch. I can't pull it off. God can, so the divine nature is clearly present. Is the human nature present in the doing of the miracle? You've got to have hands to break the bread. You've got to have a mouth to say the prayer. He's present. And so the human is doing its part, small as it may seem. The human is doing its part, and the human is physically present for the people to see God in action. And so, as Jesus is carrying out his ministry in the one person, both natures are doing their thing. At the crucifixion, this comes through even more clearly. Because at the crucifixion, you have the human nature having a key role to play. Human nature can suffer. Human nature can die. God can't die. Okay, So the divine nature, by definition, doesn't die, but the human nature can. And so the human nature is very necessary for the hypostatic union for in, in order for Christ to be able to suffer and die as the payment for sin. Because the atonement for sin, Christ taking our place, that vicarious substitution, Okay, very important word here. or vicarious, sometimes satisfaction, even though this is inflammatory to some people. The vicarious means, vicarious means standing in the stead, stand in place. The idea of the vicarious atonement or the various vicarious satisfaction means that Jesus stands in my place, he takes the wrath, I don't have to take it. And for the vicarious atonement to happen, you have to have the genus idiomaticum. Because Jesus has got to be a human to be able to take the wrath and to die. But can any human being take that kind of wrath of God and stand, handle it? No. So the Godhead is also present, sustaining and enabling Jesus to fulfill his mission. And the Godhead is also present because can any human death really count for the sins of all the world? No. But when God is combined, now it counts for everything. This is what Luther liked to say. If you put man into the balance, nothing happens. Throw God in the balance, and everything is covered. And so God in the flesh, paying at the cross the full atonement for all sins of all mankind, that's what's going on. So the Gainus Idiomaticum says both nature's properties are fully present in the one person. That's the Gainus Idiomaticum. All we're doing here with these genera is we're describing the way that the human and the divine work together. 
So we're describing. How do the human and the divine work together? They work together so that both natures are fully present. That's the first one. The second genera, or the second genus of the three genera, is the genus myostaticum. Oops. Ganus myostaticum. Ganus myostaticum. And you can see and hear the word majesty. And the Ganus myostaticum teaches that the full divine attributes are given to the human to enable the human to do what needs to be done in the personal union. And so the human nature receives from the divine the properties of the divine that it needs. So the human nature receives from the divine. The example of this would be Jesus walking on the water. So Jesus walks on the water. Can a human body displace enough water to be able to walk across the top of the waves? Can't happen. But the human body is given the divine attributes which enable it to walk across the water in a spectacular way. That's the Ganus Myostaticum. Another classic example of the Ganus Myostaticum is Jesus appearing to the disciples through the closed doors. How did he get there? Well, he just walked through. Well, any human body I know can't do that. But Jesus' body is not an ordinary human body. It is the body of Christ. And because of the Ganus myostaticum, the human nature receives from the divine nature attributes or properties to enable it to carry out the ministry that needs to be done so Jesus can walk through walls, even though any other human body I know can't do it. That's the Ganus myostaticum. And we talk about the non-reciprocity of the Ganus myostaticum. This is such good stuff. You want to really impress your friends with this. <laughs> because does the divine nature get anything from the human? No. It needs nothing. It gets nothing from the human. So this is, while the Ganus idiomaticum is reciprocal, they're both giving to the one person, the Ganus myostaticum is not. You have the person of Christ, and the human nature gets from the divine things that enable the human nature to be able to sort of keep up with Jesus, in a sense, depending on how you look at it. Because the person of Jesus has got things to do. The human nature needs some help to be able to keep up. The Ganus myostaticum is where the divine nature is giving the stuff to the human nature to enable it to do what it needs to do, to keep up and keep going. Calvin rejected this. Because Calvin said can't have a gainus myostaticum because if the human nature starts getting stuff like that, then it's not a human nature anymore. And any human body I know can't walk through walls. Calvin didn't believe Jesus walked through walls at the upper room. He believed he slipped in through an open door or crawled in through a window, which is just bizarre. But that's what Calvin believed because he, had, he was really hung up on the true human nature. In fact, Calvin starts to sound like Nestorius, and he was rather Nestorian in his views, kind of two natures side by side. And the human sometimes, and the divine sometimes, whereas Luther was far more Eutychian, no, one person, this is the real deal. And that debate just kind of still goes on. Why can't, this is just me trying to figure it out in my head, why can't Jesus walking on water mm -hmm. be genus idiomatic? Yeah. Idiomaticum, you can see it there too. You can see that because here the divine is doing this, but he's doing it, but see, the human is also, in a sense, participating in this, you know. In the it's doing something a human body can't do. Okay. Okay. Okay? But you're right. They, these are not neat. These overlap like crazy. Okay, there you go. There, there's plenty of overlap Thank here. Goodness. It's just, it's just <laughs> a matter of trying to put a clear emphasis okay. on this. Okay? Then the third gainus is what we call the gainus apotelismaticum. And the Ganus Apotelismaticum says that each nature does what is peculiar to itself, but the other participates. And the Apotelismaticum has to do with the office or the 
work of Jesus. And so you have each nature in the person carrying out its tasks for, the, for, the, for what needs to be done. Now, Gainus Apotelos Modicum and Idiomodicum start to sound very similar. And Chemnitz did a lot of work on this. And Chemnitz is the one who kind of gave us these three. And he said, if you want to have four, if you want to have two, I don't care how many genera you come up with. The main thing is you get all these teachings clearly out here. And the first teaching is the nature of the human and the divine are both fully present. And the human participates in the divine nature. And that when the person of Christ is working, doing his work, he does it according to both natures. That's what's going on here. And you might want to illustrate it something like this. If I have the person of Christ here, and I should probably give you more room so you can see this. If I have the person of Christ here, what I'm saying is I've got the human nature and I've got the divine nature, all right? Now, all of this makes up the one person of Christ. The Gainus Idiomaticum, this one, is saying that the human gives to the person and the divine gives to the person the attributes unique to it. To it. That's the Gainus Idiomaticum. Arrows going from the two natures to the one person. So the human nature gives its, 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 all of its idiomata to the person. Divine nature gives all of its idiomata to the person. So the one person has the attributes of both. That's that one. The genus myostaticum looks something like this. I would have now, I'll just keep my same thing here. hope you keep up with me. Now I have the divine nature giving its attributes to the person and in turn sharing those with the human nature. So that the human nature participates in the divine nature and is able to do things that a normal human body can't do. Walk through walls, walk on water, go back to the Father, be present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. That's where the sacrament comes in here big time. We'll come back to that in a minute. So the divine nature gives to the person, which gives to the human nature. That's the genus myostaticum. It does not work in reverse. You don't have an arrow on this end over here because the human nature is giving nothing to the divine. That's why we talk about the non-reciprocity. It doesn't cut both ways. All right? The third one, the Gainus Apotelismaticum, is saying that the person of Jesus carrying out the work of the mission works according to the human nature and according to the divine nature. So now you have the arrows going the other way. So the one person working carries it out in both areas. In both areas. That's the genus apotelosmotica. And all we're trying to do here is we're trying to be more clear and more precise in describing what do we talk about with the incarnation. What's really going on? God and man together. Two natures, one person unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably, and the three genera are just trying to put some meat on that and explain it a little more thoroughly. That's what's going on. And this becomes very relevant for Holy Communion because the Reformed believe that the finite is not capable of the infinite. And I'll give you that Latin later. That, uh, and so they would say, there's no way that a human body can take all that divine stuff and still be a human body. Try to pour God into me and I'll get blown apart. And so they were convinced that if you try to put all of God into Jesus, he's not a human being anymore. So their argument was, no, the human being has to stand separately. That's why it starts to sound kind of Nestorian. It's sort of like you got the human part over here, the divine part over here. And so Calvin also argued that a real human body cannot possibly be present everywhere. And a real human body cannot possibly be multiplied millions of times over in every celebration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So, he argued that when you receive Holy Communion, you're receiving the presence of Christ according to the divine nature, but not the human. And we say, what are you talking about? You've just divided the hypostatic union. And you've ended it. And you can't do that, because the hypostatic union goes forever. So we would argue, where Jesus is, he is body and soul. Human and divine. Both. Not an either or. It's not as if, and see, Calvin all talks it like Jesus parks his body up in some corner of heaven somewhere, and then he goes taken off all over everywhere else according to his divine nature, doing what he needs to do. 
while his body sits up in heaven. We say, no, where Jesus is, he is present with his human flesh and with his spiritual presence. Now, how? I don't know. <laughs> and I can't even begin to guess or imagine. But he is because he promises. And this is what makes Luther, Luther. He takes God at his word. Jesus says, I'm here. Okay. And Calvin said, doesn't make sense. And that was always Calvin's problem. Okay? Questions? <laughs> okay. Sure. Got it down. No problem. So, um, before we leave this, tell me what transubstantiation then means to the Catholics. And well, actually, we're going to pick that up all by itself here in a future time. But, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll cover that when we get to the Lord's Supper. I think it's a whole presentation all by itself. <laughs> and I would hate to just pack it in here as a quick answer. Yeah. This has reminded me a lot of what you said yesterday about what, what we will be like after Christ returns and resurrects us. Mm. That we will have eternal physical bodies. Right. Yeah. Very much. You see, and when you, when you start to understand the hypostatic union and what the incarnation really means, it becomes very physical, very tangible, very real. That's, that's the cool thing about this. Christ is a physical human body for eternity. Now, that just blows me away. What a, what a blessing that we're united with Christ in that way. Our flesh in heaven with Christ. Wow. That's something else. And you see, how can you possibly start, you know, throwing around Gnostic ideas of the, the human body being bad or material being evil? That's just absurd. What do you mean? Christ would not take flesh into himself and bring evil into the Godhead. Not evil. It's good. No doubt about it. And so we need to change our attitude toward the material and the physical world and, and embrace it as God's good creation, just as Christ did. Okay? Good point. All right, good. Tomorrow, we're going to press forward, and we're going to get into the work of Christ. That's where we pick up a chapter 8, and we'll crank through the work of Christ, and we'll talk about humiliation, exaltation stuff a little bit more, and salvation stuff, and we'll talk about justification, and long gospel, and all kinds of stuff. So, read onward. We're done for the day. Have a great afternoon. Yeah. Is the test that we're taking, is it going to be the qualifier? I'm still working on that. Okay. I'm talking to the powers that be.